Hello everyone, today I'm taking the near 14 year old Pentium D820 for a spin to see how it stacks up today in gaming and a couple of benchmarks as well. Originally, AMD were due to release what, at the time, would have been the first dual core processor for consumer desktops. They already had dual core CPUs for the workstation and server market at this point, but in response, Intel came up with the Pentium D line, the first of which was the Pentium D840 Extreme Edition. However, as I said though, I'm taking a look at the Pentium D820 today. The whole Pentium D-Line wasn't like the dual cores of today. It was basically two Pentium 4 CPUs stuck together. The 820 was clocked at 2.8GHz with an 800MHz frontside bus and featured no turbo boosting or hyper-threading unlike what is common today. It used the Smithfield architecture and featured 230 million transistors, built on the 90nm fabrication process and had 2 megabytes of L2 cache with a TDP of 95 watts. Originally, the 820 went on sale for $241 US dollars, which adjusting for inflation is $311 today, which is around £246 or €273 Euros today. However, at CEX here in the UK, you can buy it for as little as 25 British pence. You can however also pick it up on eBay in America for around $2.89 if you order from China. I wouldn't recommend this processor however, as it is far worse performing than equally priced alternatives. The rest of the system I'll be using today features a Foxconn G33M motherboard, 8GB of DDR2 RAM at 800MHz, a MSI GTX 1080 Armour OC Edition graphics card from my personal system. This eliminates any potential performance bottleneck other than the Pentium itself, Windows 7 Ultimate 64-bit, and the Fantex TC14PE to keep the Pentium cool. First up for the tests today is Cinebench R15 a multi-threaded benchmark popular with extreme overclockers, designed to test your processor's multi-core performance by rendering a photorealistic 3D scene. I wasn't exactly expecting a good performance here, and I was right. At the Pentium D820's stock speed of 2.8GHz with 800MHz RAM, it only managed to score a lowly 65 points, which is around 3.1% slower than a standard 2GHz Celeron E1400. Overclocking wise though, I managed to get a stable clock in Cinebench of 3.75GHz which gave a new score of 87, a 33.8% increase in performance which puts it level with a 1.8GHz Core 2 Duo E4300. I needed to increase the frontside bus speed to 1070MHz with a voltage of around one36 volts under load. As my motherboard doesn't have load line calibration settings, the voltage went as high as one44 volts at idle. This frontside bus speed also put the RAM up to 892MHz. For a while now, I've been wanting to include more CPU benchmarks, so I decided to throw the physics test and 3 Mark Firestrike into the mix as well. And at stock speeds, the A20 could only manage a score of 871, and when overclocking to the same speeds as what I used in Cinebench R15, the Pentium could now manage a score of 1,271 points, a massive 45.9% increase in performance. Not that that makes it great, obviously, as it is still a terrible performer. And to kick off the gaming tests, we have Grand Theft Auto V, which finally had its much anticipated PC release in 2015. It was console exclusive for quite a while before that. Today, I'll be running the game at 1080p with the lowest settings possible. And as expected, the game performed pretty badly, far worse than I had actually expected. Driving through the city on the way to Michael's is excruciatingly bad. There are massive amounts of micro stuttering and locking up throughout the city, and there's a huge amount of input lag and input locking as well. It's so bad to the point where you can't even move for significant periods of time, and you'll have next to no control over which direction you travel. It actually made me give up on doing a frames per second benchmark, as it is quite literally impossible to play the game in this state. Next up is on to CSGO, or Counter-Strike Global Offensive to give it its full name which today is still massively popular and has a huge professional scene as well. I'll also be running this game at the lowest settings possible at 1080p and in a hard difficulty competitive bot match on the Mirage map. I wasn't sure what to expect given how well CSGO can run on some older processors, but unfortunately it was another pretty poor showing for the Pentium D820. FPS was in the low 10s to around 30 frames per second and stuttered really severely throughout the test. Combat was also extremely difficult, which would be made even worse if you went online against real people. A Fraps benchmark showed an average of 23 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 20 and 7 frames per second respectively. And looking at the frame time graph, I saw several gaps between frames of around 120 to 140 milliseconds 
with several more even worse than that. For the third game in the test today, it's probably one of my favourite games right now, Warframe, which is free to play on Steam and will keep you occupied for hours at a time. I'm also running this test at 1080p on the lowest settings preset I can, and a survival mission on Jupiter. It was another poor showing for the Pentium here, as the FPS never really got above 30 frames per second during gameplay. It was pretty stuttery when moving the camera about on the landing craft and on the planet selection map as well. In gameplay itself, the FPS stuck around the high teens to the high 20s and stuttered pretty severely at times and briefly locked up on several occasions as well. The game also dropped below 20 frames per second in intense scenes with lots of enemies coming towards you. Even firing guns was affected as well, with a noticeable slowdown in the fire rate of weapons due to how badly the game performed. Traps benchmark showed an average of 27 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 14 and 10 frames per second respectively, with the frame time graph showing several gaps between some of the frames of around 70 to over 100 milliseconds throughout the test, with one occasion where the game locked up for 420 milliseconds. And lastly, before moving on to overclocking, it's the return of Rise of the Tomb Raider, the second game in the rebooted Tomb Raider series. Again, this has been run at the lowest settings possible at 1080p, and in the entire time I've been running this channel, the Pentium D820 is by far the worst performer in this game that I've ever tested. At times, the game spent more time locked up than actually running. There were excruciatingly long loading times, massive amounts of input lag, and the FPS was no better than 12 to 13 frames per second at the best of times. The lockups, as I mentioned, were awful and lasted several seconds, which means for a large portion of the test, the game was effectively doing zero frames per second. Performance in the Soviet installation was pretty bad too, with near slideshow-like performance throughout. The best way I can think of to describe this without swearing is to call it far beyond being beyond unplayable. A Fraps benchmark showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 16, 4 and 1 frame per second respectively, so there isn't really any need to look at the frame time graph to show just how bad the game performed. Moving on to overclocking, and as I mentioned earlier, I managed to get 3.75GHz with 892 MHz on the RAM, stable for Cinebench R15 and Firestrike Physics. This unfortunately wasn't stable in the games though, but I did however manage to get 3.66GHz stable instead, which put the RAM at a frequency of 871 MHz. I also used the same voltage settings for this as I did for Cinebench and Firestrike Physics with a frontside bus speed of 1045 MHz to get to 3.66 GHz. With Grand Theft Auto V, the game was still completely unplayable. Driving through the city was still a pretty hard thing to achieve. FPS was still in the low 10s to the high teens, and the severe input locking and input lag, although not quite as bad, was most certainly still there and still just as game breaking as it was as stop clocks. I again decided to give up on the benchmark, as the game is still completely unplayable in this state. CSGO showed a small improvement and, in parts, was actually kind of playable. The Fentium managed frames per second in the low 20s to the high 40s range. There was also still some very noticeable stuttering though as well. Combat was a lot easier than it was at stop clocks, and overall the game just tended to run a bit smoother than it did at stop clocks. The Fraps benchmark showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 32, 17 and 13 frames per second respectively. There were also multiple gaps between some of the frames of around 70 to 90 milliseconds, with more around the 180 to 240 millisecond range, making for some pretty uncomfortable gameplay at times. Moving on to Warframe, and the game was actually mostly playable and quite enjoyable, to the point that I forgot I was supposed to be testing it and not just playing it for fun. There was little to no stutter on the landing craft, although there were a few brief lockups here, with the planet selection screen still being stuttery as well. Throughout the test, FPS was in mid-30s, up to around 52 to 53 frames per second. There was, however, still some noticeable stuttering and some brief lockups throughout the mission as well, and the game still dips under 30 frames per second at times when there is smoke around. The Fraps benchmark showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 40, 21 and 17 frames per second respectively. The frame time graph shows the aforementioned dips below 30 frames per second happening several times throughout the test although not all of them were noticeable. Lastly for the test today, it's back to Rise of the Tomb Raider, and as you've probably guessed by now, the game is unfortunately still pretty unplayable. The severe locking up that occurred every couple of seconds as stock locks were actually mostly gone, 
However, there was still the odd lockup that lasted for a fair bit. FPS was in the 9 to 20 frames per second range at best, and there was still some very obvious stuttering throughout the test at points as well. Combat was still really difficult, and overall the experience was a truly awful one, but perhaps benchmarks showed an average of 20 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 5 and 3 frames per second respectively. There were also multiple gaps between some of the frames of over 800 milliseconds, and two that were around 4.5 and 6.5 seconds respectively. Overall, the Pentium D820 performed as badly as I was expecting, and at times performed far worse than I was expecting. Grand Theft Auto V truly was completely unplayable, as was Rise of the Tomb Raider. Warframe and CSGO, on the other hand, were actually kind of playable at points, at least when the Pentium was overclocked. As I mentioned earlier though, there are far better performing alternatives that cost the exact same 25 pence that you can buy this for at CEX here in the UK. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking the video or leaving a comment. I'd also really appreciate it if you could share this video to others that you think may enjoy it. It would also mean a huge deal to me if you'd subscribe to my channel as well if you'd like to see more content like this. So thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.